Church. All right. Good evening. We'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and get going uh, for the committee of the whole meeting Monday, June twenty third. Uh, call to order. Uh, roll call. Boren here. Bauk here. Decker here. Gisha here. Heidemann, uh, Hannah, Hannah, excused. Heidemann. Here. Kittleson. Here. Clayunas, excused. Meyer. Absent. Montemayor. Here. Here. Rinfleisch. Absent. Ryan. Here. Surik. Here. Vanderwilly. Bert Hasselt. Here. Ann Wangeman. Here. Quorum is present, Mr. Good. Chairman. Very good. Thank you. We will uh, do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> All right. Thank you for being here tonight. I would entertain a motion uh, to approve the minutes of the last, uh, the two previous committee of the whole meetings. For a second. Okay. Uh, Who is the cool. second? It's the two of us, Gisha and Okay. Uh, so we have a uh, motion and a second to approve the minutes of both the May 12th and June 9th committee of the whole meetings. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved for both of those meetings. Uh, number five, discussion and a recommendation vote on resolution number 50809, which is uh, council item 5 49. We'll spend uh, up to 60 minutes on a resolution by Elder Persons Born, Clayunis, Heidemann, and Verhasselt authorizing a City of Sheboygan residency requirement for all newly hired, including full time and part time, non rep employees. Thank, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, I make a motion to send a recommendation to the Common Council supporting 50-0809 Council Document Number 5-49, the residency requirement for newly hired non-represented employees, both full and part-time, as it is set forth in the resolution. Second. Have motion and a second under discussion. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, again. Under discussion, uh, the Salary and Grievance Committee recently adopted a City of Sheboygan residency policy. It's a, uh, a three-page document. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the new residency, I'm sorry, the, the, the policy guidelines were requested by Fire Chief Lestusky to monitor compliance to the fire department's new residency policy for new hires. I worked on, the po on this policy with Chief Lestusky and Attorney McLean, and it was modeled after Milwaukee's residency policy in also recent court cases. The new, pol the new residency policy would also be used to monitor compliance of the residency requirement in document number 549 we are now considering for newly hired non-represented employees. I also wanted to remind the council that <clears throat> I believe we unanimously reaffirmed our policy that all department heads have to live in the city of Sheboygan, and we did that recently. The new, the new city of Sheboygan residency policy will also be used to monitor compliance by department heads that they live in the city of Sheboygan. One thing I want to mention about uh, the document we're considering tonight is let me make it very clear that uh, document number 549 only affects newly hired full and part-time non-represented employees. It does not affect any current city employees. I think for the same reasons it is important for department heads and newly hired fire department employees to live in the city, newly hired non-represented employees also should be uh, required to live in the city of Sheboygan. I believe it is important for the employees to take ownership and be involved in the community where they work. 
I also believe that city residents should have uh, the opportunity for these high paying, family supporting city positions. Several of my constituents have suggested to me that they believe it is important for city employees, for city employees to live and pay taxes in the city where they work. Thank you very much and I would appreciate your support. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Alderman Wongerman, please. And just for the, uh, the body's knowledge, we are uh, on TV tonight and it will be played again. So please do use your microphone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I couldn't agree with uh, Vice President Bourne more. I too have received calls from constituents, uh, people who feel that if you live and work here, you should pay your taxes here. Uh, you have a greater connection to the city when you live in the city, and I think it's quite important. So I did some research on the internet and looked at surrounding cities in uh, Wisconsin and in other states, and almost universally, employees are required to live within the city limits, even to the point where uh, several cities have a ruling that every committee member, even if they're not aldermen, must reside in the city. So therefore, if you have commission or a board where you appoint uh, people too, they too also must live in the city. So it's not something that's really terribly new and I think it's not asking too much of a person that if he wants to uh, work for the city then he should reside here also so he has that connection to the city and a, uh, a greater uh, feeling of belonging to the community he works in. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Wongman. Alderman Gisha. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I have several questions I'll ask a little bit later but uh, just a question for Alderperson Wongman. Uh, can you give us a list of some of these communities? I know that the city of Sheboygan does have where your commissioners and, and members of boards have to reside in the city already, but regarding like communities like Plymouth or Manitowoc or whatever, can you give us a list of such communities? I, I could in the future. I don't have it with me here. The uh, information is at home, but I, I certainly can provide it for you see, at, the, at the next council meeting. Thank you. Alderman Ryan. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I too support this. Uh, my only question is, I mean, I believe that definitely uh, full-time employees should live in the city. I mean, no doubt. Um, Part-time employees also, but when it comes to, I mean, it, say if you, we have a situation where we have a temporary part-time position uh, to be filled, I mean, and they come across you know, quite regularly temporary part-time positions, and, and a lot of those sometimes are positions that involve a certain amount of, of, of expertise in a certain field. Um, is there a mechanism here to, if this passes, which I believe it will, um, in certain situations that the council could still have the levity to appoint somebody that is not a city resident? Do you, do you want to answer that? Thank you for board. the question, question, Alderman Ryan. I believe, as the document reads right now, <clears throat> it doesn't give that it doesn't give that discretion. Uh, this after it passes after it after it goes to this body tonight, and if it's approved or if it isn't approved, it's still going to be referred to the Salary and Grievance Committee, and that might be the place. Unless you wanted to make a specific motion tonight, that might be the place to maybe do some housekeeping on the document. It, document itself um, yep. but at but at the present time I don't think there's anything in here that that allows for those exceptions uh, I guess I guess practically if we were doing a temporary part-time position and we could not find a city resident to fill that position uh, we could possibly go outside the community and also I don't think this precludes let's say for example a person from Plymouth uh, applying even for a full-time position, but they would have to make the uh, decision after a prob probationary period if they wanted to move to the city. Perhaps we should be a little more flexible for temporary part-time positions. That's, uh, I think that's a good thought. I think, I think so. I mean, def definitely, though, on, on, uh, on uh, permanent positions, I support this 100%. Thank you. Marge, did you have a question? Yes, 
Yep. She should really come up to yep. the mic. Would you come up to the mic? Thanks, Marge. We'll turn that one on. Do you want my name and address, too? <laughs> <laughs> um, when the city hires a You should, but you probably should give it. My name is Marge Sagali. I reside at 2732B North Savannah Circle, Sheboygan. Um, when it comes to the city hiring department heads, um, and say, say, for instance, of course, that they're from out of town, is there a certain amount of time that is required for them to move into town and to purchase a home or an apartment, et cetera? Thank you. Alderman Sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can answer Margie's question. You have four uh, uh, non-represented employees, like you know, non-union employees, that there's a probationary period of six months, and they must maintain or achieve move into the city uh, and make residency with, within that six-month period. And there is no provision for an exception for non-represented employees. Um, and if I recall, <clears throat> the way the ordinance is written is that if they do not, they will have to... Uh, Relieve their employment with the city. Now, if they're not able to, if, if I may still. In the microphone. Um, if they're not able to find residency, say for instance, within that six months, do you allow the, allow them more time, or is that six months a definite thing that you have to then live in the city? Well, with my tenure, city, we've never had an exception that that uh, uh, that. Particularly, the department has, which would apply specifically. They had always uh, established residency prior mm -hmm. to the six months. Okay. Does that also mean that they just have to rent an apartment here and still have the residency out of the city? Well, it really wasn't defined. I think I think uh, Alden Board is being more defined. But uh, where we interpreted was that they had to, had to live specifically in the city. You know, the driver's license would have to reflect that they live in the city. That they're, they'd be paying taxes as a either as a a renter, for example, uh, and of course they wouldn't have to pay tax, but if they were, were to uh, purchase a home, they'd have to be paying, paying tax. But basically, this would be the permanent residency, would be the city of Shibuya. Thank you. Thank you, Marge. It would be your intent, right, uh, Alderman Bourne? Yes. It, I think it's in the document that... that uh, primary residency? Yes. Yeah, and that's covered in, I believe it's covered in the uh, residency policy that Salary and Grievance recently passed, and I have it in the document here that... Uh, uh, will within six months or after a probationary period, whichever comes first, be or become a full-time resident of the city of Sheboygan. Could I ask a follow-up just to Mr. Surik? Please. Uh, Mr. Uh, Alderman Surik, in this very, very tough real estate market right now, and somebody owned a house and they were not able to sell it, and, they, and the department head did not have the financial means to own two homes, would it be possible to grant an extension under the circumstances with our real estate market right now? Uh, I think currently the way the policy is written, I don't believe there is an exception. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I think we've all experienced, I mean, I had the same experience, although our home did sell properly, but we were prepared to move here and, and establish residency when I, when I was a department head. And we have, through the past, we have Bill Balky, I think uh, um, he... Uh, Purchased a home here. Um, uh, I think more specifically, Dave Lutsky, who is our city assessor, he had to maintain residency at a home in Madison, which he may, maybe still hasn't sold yet, but he did purchase a home in the city. So it kind of comes, I guess, with the turf that if you're willing to accept employment with the city, that you must follow those terms. So. And one follow up, uh, Ed. Uh, can you give me a, a sense of what percent of city employees are non rep? About, uh, well, and but there's about 62 employees that are not represented. Okay. The residency requirement as it exists right now for specific city residency applies to department head. I think that's six people. Okay. okay. So it would be 50, 55 more people right. for future hires. But it, 55 of 420 employees? Probably around close to 500, yeah. Okay, but this wouldn't but, affect them because it's only for new hires. I'm just trying to get the, a sense uh, of how many. But to go a little further, for non, the other non-represented employees, there is a policy they must maintain residency within two-thirds of, of Sheboygan County. The four townships on the western edge do not count as, as a requirement on the residency. They must move within that two-thirds of the Sheboygan County to uh, maintain their employment with the city. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Gisha, you're next. I don't know if we have to stand up or not. 
Uh, Please. Thanks. Uh, and I don't mean to make this the Ed Sirk show, but uh, <laughs> if, maybe if other people have input, is there an expense to residency for the city? You talk about the awareness of taxes, et cetera, but do we end up paying more money because we, if you're going to give something, you got to get something. It's the only way negotiations work. Has it been anybody's experience that we perhaps pay more because would end up paying more because of uh, that requirement? Uh, I, my experience in recruiting with the city has never become an issue. I've never had a candidate come back and say, "Well, you know, I'm not really uh, in favor of your residency policy. Could you give me a larger salary?" And it's never been an issue uh, for, the, for the number of hires I've had experience with the city. Yeah. If I can follow up. Uh. Thank you. You know, there are, this isn't an easy question, and Alderman Bourne knows I'm not a big fan of residency requirements, uh, and, and maybe if I could uh, bring up a couple of reasons why. Um, first, we all read about the city of Milwaukee, which has heavy-duty residency, and, and what it's done to that city as far as the brain drain uh, on that city, and um, particularly the residency requirement on the, uh, on the teachers for the city of Milwaukee having to live in the city. That hasn't worked out particularly well with 50% truancy and 50% graduation rates. Uh, I think if we had those kind of numbers here in the city, we'd be storming those buildings. Second, my, my caution on residency comes from a, a study done by Professor Lillijohn at Lakeland College, not some college somewhere else in this world, nice here in Sheboygan County. And he was commissioned to do a study for residency for communities and his original thought was that he was going to find that residency was a good thing bar none because of taxes and the things that people are talking about you know you live in the city you're paying those taxes and and you're going to not want taxes to go up and salaries to go up and you're one of those that are paying it but what he found was to his surprise was completely the opposite and and his report is available at Lakeland College's study is that what you do, according to him, is a voting block. If you have a thousand people associated, let's take, we're talking about 60, you just use that round number, they're married, you have 120, and, uh, and uh, most elections in this town, if you extrapolate that out, can be, and now we then, in the future, if this is a benchmark to go to requiring our union members in contractual uh, discussions, that would be the obvious next step of this. Um, you could have a voting block of a thousand people in this town. That influences every election. A voting block of a thousand gets people elected who maybe wouldn't want, would, would be more inclined to raise employee salaries at a higher level than maybe we all would like. Um, and just because their taxes goes up a hundred bucks a year or 150 bucks a year, they will gain that many, 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 many times fold dozens of times fold by getting the compounding of larger salary increases and benefit increases, et cetera, et cetera. So, and this isn't me saying this, this is uh, Professor Lakeland, um, and that was the conclusion of his studies. He cautions municipalities of doing this for the creation of this voting block that ends up doing exactly the opposite of what emotionally we all want to, <laughs> emotionally we all would think, great, you got to live in the city. You get paid by the city, you live in the city. But there are consequences to this. And, and he, he, again, did a 180 on his initial um, conclusion or where he thought the study was going to go to. And, and the second having to do with reality of today's families. I commuted to Waukesha for five years from Sheboygan because I wanted to live in Sheboygan. Now, if, if my employer said, you got to live in Waukesha, I, I probably would be moving to Waukesha, I suppose. But I-43 in our system of, of families today, where if you've got, let's say you've got a wonderful candidate for job X, a wonderful one. Everybody wants so this person, he or she, would be a great candidate. But she works in, in Milwaukee. He works, wants to work in Sheboygan. Do we blow off an excellent candidate just because, and this could be a candidate for an office job in Sheboygan because they happen that makes 35000 or $20,000 a year because they want to live in Port Washington because of the economics of today's families. You know, so we will constrict our pool of candidates for these jobs. It'll just happen. There's no other way around that. And we just have to be prepared for having a smaller pool of candidates. 
And how do you make up for a smaller pool of candidates? You end up raising pay and raising benefits to entice people to come in. So I, Professor Lillijohn had some wise advice and other things for us all to think about. I admit I had no issue with residency until I read his report, until you realize it's a little bigger than just the emotional aspect. Emotionally, yeah, you gotta live in the city, you gotta work here, you get your pay here. But the reality is that there are other factors that end up, it could end up being the opposite of what the intent of this, I think, well-intentioned legislation. So his research would say that they could vote, they could be, create a voting block that could increase their own pay and benefits, that could sway the vote on pay and benefits that would grow faster than what their property taxes would Correct. grow. Correct. Interesting. Uh, next up, Alderman Hassel, please. Thank you. Uh, as far as a lot of the exceptions that have been brought up, if I, and correct me, Alderman Surik, having been previous HR director, or Alderman Montemar being chair of salary and grievance, but in any of the cases similar to this that I've seen in the past, if the HR director would come to us with some dire circumstances, they were, have been unable to hire, whether it be HR director or a simple uh, uh, journeyman type job, they could come to our committee, ask for an exception and we could then make that recommendation to the council. So there's really the, the opportunity for any exception would, I mean, the sky's the limit. I mean, could be recommended back to the salary and grievance committee. So there could be a lot of remedies, I guess, work in progress. We don't need to, I think, solve it all up front. You know, we have committees in place that can deal with the exceptions that come to us. I guess that's okay. my, my thought. Um, as far as the voting blocks, I mean, it's interesting, but I think you were mentioning, Alderman Gish, a thousand people. If you break it out into the eight districts, I suppose it puts it down to 125. And then only if you had full part voter participation would you have, you know, so it's mitigated quite a bit when you take into the fact that it's spread over eight districts and you're only going to maybe get, on average, you get 30 to 40 percent voter participation across the city. So then it takes it down to more like 40 people. My hunch, though, is that those people would be impassioned to vote. They would be Possibly. motivated, more motivated to vote than the average percent of voter you participation. Like but if, if, the yeah. argument, if the argument was made, the devious circumstances were exposed that were presented by Alderman Gishy, that they were out for this sort of objective to raise their own wages, I suppose the opponent could draw, you know, draw some light to that and, and inspire their own voting block to come out and fight against it. So sure. I, I like the idea of keeping it at the voter level. I'm not too concerned when voters are the ones making decisions. I kind of like that. So. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite um, Director Bittner and Deputy Chief Shervin to weigh in on, you, on the effect, what you think the effect of hiring for your two departments would be if this were to pass. If there were to be a residency requirement, it may not pay. I'm not sure how many non-reps uh, are in your two departments, but I'd like you to come up if you would and just, just give your, your general opinion mm -hmm. on the effect of your ability to hire given a residency requirement. I guess in regards to non-reps, that would be normally people that would have been on our department for many years. It would have been, a, a, you know, established officers. And there's a, there's two non-rep positions on our department, the chiefs and, and mine. And so it would and normally for somebody to be promoted to those positions, you're talking probably in the area of 25 years or so. So as far as as far as that issue with the with the non reps, because we have a, sm a small amount, we have um, a, the, also the chief secretary. I take that back as a is is a non rep. So you know, again, these are positions that it's not normally hired from the outside because it has a lot to do with experience. So it's it's established employees. Okay, so no no effect on uh, the police department unless we need to hire a new secretary. From a, yeah, because exactly, okay. it's normally ex very experienced sure. secretaries that are the chief secretary that have probably been around. I would, uh, just my offhand recollection, have been here the longest and, and have the widest range of uh, experience because they've got to know the, the policies and procedures sure. within the police department. Okay, thank you. And Director Bittner? I had a question for... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Alderman Gisha. Thank you. Al, scenario. Um, Paula retires. You have an internal person then who wants to apply for her job, and maybe they, that job now pays $10,000 more than their old job. Does residency, does this address residency? Uh, they're going to be making more money. They're gonna, it's a new position and all that. Maybe, maybe it's actually it's more of a question for, for Jim. Does, does this residency policy include a person from applying for an internal job that would be a major step up? 
Do they have to become <laughs> residents to take the promotion, I guess? I guess my answer to that uh, at first blush would be yes, they would have, they would have to become a resident uh, if, they were not, if they were already not a resident. <clears throat> Then I guess that could have a, a serious impact with on, in our department because the people that would be applying at, at this point, because it would be affecting all new hirees, uh, wouldn't I'm necessarily be uh, wouldn't necessarily be residents. I, now I didn't understand the question. No, it would not because that's an existing employee. If it, it would have to be a totally, the way I, this is meant to be written is that it's a totally new hire that's not working for the city at this Nothing time. Nothing to do with job, right, or openings or any of that, okay. right. And perhaps just a suggestion, perhaps to eliminate that vagueness, perhaps that first sentence, all newly hired, perhaps that could be not currently a, an employee of the city of Sheboygan, just a thought. Uh, and then, uh, Bob, did you have a, a question no, for, I'm oh, okay. Spanish. Okay. Thanks for turning my microphone off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so we had, oh, and Director Bittner, do you want to? This is one of these issues I feel strongly both ways. Uh, been in many communities. It has been debated in every community that I can remember since the 1970s with good arguments both ways. Uh, the one thing I do know from my experience in major urban areas, I think Milwaukee was already cited, I've been in the Twin Cities, I've been in Omaha urban areas, where there's a huge or a large number of cities that make up one urban area, uh, trying to subdivide the workforce really doesn't work. It's more viable in other communities I've been in that are freestanding, such as Sheboygan. We are the center hub. We're sort of a, a freestanding community and probably have... Uh, uh, more workability there because a larger part of the population base does live uh, within that boundary you draw around it. So if it's going to have a chance to work, we're, we're the kind of community that, uh, that it maybe has a chance in, a, but a suburb of the Twin Cities or something, it just simply does not work because with our modern families, you just can't uh, uh, limit your, your population base. Uh, having clarified that the grandfathering goes to the individual, not the position, I think that's a that's a real critical one because I've been in places where the history, there's groups of people grandfathered, not grandfathered, then over time they're grandfathered again and you have a catalog of dates when you, when you have to live in the city and when you don't. So it has been an issue that in my experience, uh, uh, usually you have to live within the restrictions we have. We have many. Uh, they usually work themselves out. I guess if I were falling one way or the other on the issue, I'd probably lean against a residency requirement. But as I say, I feel strongly both ways because I inherently have the gut reaction that people have talked about up here, that if you're going to be a major player in my department, if you're going to work for the citizens, there's something visceral that says you ought to be part of this city all the way. Uh, but there's there's more backup from that emotion. There's some reasons that you don't want to limit the, the can candidate pool. So my original statement was right. I feel strongly both ways. <laughs> Do you have? A, can you give me a general percentage of how many non reps in public works? Oh, how many positions might be non rep? You're in the twenty some, I think. Okay, that sound right. right? Yeah. And would, how do you feel that that would uh, affect your ability to hire for those twenty positions as natural attrition happens in them? Uh, you, you, you do eliminate the candidate pool, you eliminate the, it, it, it eliminates the candidate pool or restricts the candidate pool, the suggested limits, and how much, I don't know if anybody can tell you, it's, it's just a factor. It's, uh, um, you know, the great thing Sheboygan has going for it, it's a great place to live and hopefully the people that are looking for this lifestyle are, are going to come here anyway. The, Ones that want to live in downtown Chicago aren't, aren't looking at Sheboygan, but uh, okay. And I uh, just want to get there are some people out there with questions. Alderman Ryan, yeah, thank you. Um, no, this isn't for this isn't for. Oh, Bill. okay. Thank you, Director Bittner. I, I, I have one for Mr. Bittner. Oh, okay. Hang on, Bill. <laughs> um, I'm gonna. Uh, Jim has a question, and then we'll get. To <clears throat> uh, Mr. Bittner, I believe you recently hired an electrician, and. 
how many candidates did you have apply for that position, and do you know approximately what the breakdown was between city residents and non-city residents for that electrician position, and did you end up hiring a city resident or a non-resident? Okay. The ability to do that job was a very definitive one. You had to be a licensed electrician. There was, there was a very A, B, C, D. Did you meet those? That's not always the case, particularly in management. Uh, so we had a group of candidates. I'm not going to try to guess at the number. Um, and so we had a group of probably 15 to 20 that we thought met that qualification well. Part of the market right now. Normally we would not get that number of, of highly skilled people. Uh, we then had to make a decision on how we're going to whittle that down because we really, there's only so many people you can rationally consider. And we used uh, residency in the city as one of our criteria of what, who we'd consider for the second stage of the interview. I believe we had one candidate that seemed to have some experience more conducive to our work that was not a resident. So when it came down to interviewing, we only interviewed one non-resident. And by the way, that didn't turn out to be the case, so we hired a resident. Uh, but we actually used residency as part of our criteria, all else being equal. Thank you. Uh, and Alderman Hassel, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bittner, could you give us an idea, I guess, of the skill levels of the type of non-reps that are in your department? I mean, what type of positions are we looking at when we talk about non-reps in public work? Uh, in engineering is not in my department, but it's usually associated with it in, 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 in uh, city development. That's, that's a big issue. You have, you have the engineering staff and the technical staff, which is a... I would say a hard to find skill right now. So I, I wanted to bring that up rather than just isolating on public works department because it's, it's critical there. Uh, you're, you're probably recruiting in a very difficult market because you're both uh, in a market that have pretty good salaries uh, and a market that, that education is, is reasonably scarce. Uh, in a public works operation, you'll have a couple and would want to try to have a couple people engineering or technical training in that area but mostly you would want uh, facility type managers, people who maintain buildings and, and things of that nature. Uh, that would be generally a general management background and you probably would draw those people or could draw those people from the private sector. In other words, an awful lot of companies have facility managers. They have, just like we maintain a city hall, they maintain office buildings. Uh, so. A lot of what we do in the operational end of public works can either be filled through the general private sector training or skill level, and a lot of it's just brought up from the ground up. People who uh, uh, have worked there and had worked their way through the, the uh, labor positions and have shown the ability to move up to foremen and supervisors and things like that. A lot of them would come up through the ranks? Yes. Okay. Yes. Would there uh, be, you're talking about engi engineering operations, would some of these be degree requirements in that, those fields? Yeah, degree, uh, either actually engineering degrees or technical degrees. Uh, that would only be the limited, probably the top people in uh, public works, but in engineering, obviously, it's most of Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Director Bittner, one more question. Um, I, I lost my thought. Uh, oh, uh, seasonal employees, those, those handful of employees that you ha would hire for five or six months a year, would you have any problem filling those uh, seasonal spots if, we, if that, we... That one's of a concern because we hire an awful co a lot of college students and stuff and they don't necessarily all come back home. We have positions such as lifeguards at the, at the quarry where we're each year faced with uh, do we have enough, can we find them all. Um, the unskilled, I shouldn't say unskilled because we have a lot of young people who bring a lot of abilities to our job, but just that general laborer that we use in the summer, I would think you'd find quite a few uh, locally uh, specialty positions and simply the life-saving life, life -saving, uh, Red Cross training is not that available or when you have it, you can find a lot of summer positions that do it with you're competing with resorts and camps and those type of things. That's the only one that comes to mind though. Okay. And Chairperson Montemayor, within salary and grievances, would you see any problem if there were uh, a few positions? Is that something that would normally salary and grievances might move to, to waive that required temporary 
uh, college kids and the like? I'm sure if it came to, to having somebody as a lifeguard or not having a body there, of course we would waive that so we could have um, a qualified lifeguard. Okay, yeah. thank you. And all person Ryan. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, what Alderman Gisha said here about the, the whole Milwaukee scenario, and uh, it's, it's a, it is a very good point. Um, it's, but, I, I mean, Milwaukee and Sheboygan are, are two totally different animals, in my opinion. Um, let's face it, the city of Milwaukee proper, I don't think I'd want to live there. And, you know, I mean, I don't know of many other people living in Sheboygan that would either. Um, but when you look at these positions, these, these, these well-compensated positions, um, and you look at the city of Sheboygan, I mean, these, I think, are the type of people that we want living in the city. Uh, we want, you know, we want to, to have, uh, especially, you know, being, being paid by the city is one thing, but if we're having people taking these positions that are going to move in from out of town, <clears throat> Uh, when they are well-compensated positions, those are the people we want living in the city. Uh, they're going to buy or build a home that's going to add to the tax base. Um, and let's face it, there's a lot of nice areas in, of our city that are available for them to live in. It's not like we are Milwaukee, where you have um, one area that is uh, so highly taxed that nobody could afford to live there unless they've, uh, they've got old money and they've inherited their home. And a lot of the rest of the city, you wouldn't want to live in. You know, that's not the case here. So, you know, I think that uh, that, that is how I can reason, uh, uh, you know, kind of reason out the Milwaukee scenario um, and uh, think that this would probably work much better in Sheboygan. Okay. Oh, I'm born. When Alderman Gisher brought up the Milwaukee residency in Milwaukee, <clears throat> I had a friend uh, that lived up on 99th and Good Hope, which and this was about seven or eight years ago, which was at that time was a pretty good neighborhood. And he and his wife wanted to be close to their summer home up in uh, northern Wisconsin and be able to get out of there. So they wanted to build a home in Sockville. He listed his home, I believe, the first weekend in August. And he had, a, he had an offer and he sold it for the first the, he sold it the first weekend for his asking price and it was for a young man who was an engineer that was going to be more working in the city of Milwaukee and had to get his school kids in school right after labor day so in his case it really turned out it really turned out well in fact they sold it so fast they had to live in an apartment for 6 months before the house was done but this was a four this was a four bedroom home a large home but the marriage did survive in spite of them being in an apartment for six months before their house was done in Sockville. So in his case, this residency thing worked good for him because he sold his house the first weekend he had it on the market. And it just happened to be somebody coming in that was going to work for the city that needed a home and pronto. Probably anecdotal evidence at best, though. <laughs> um, I wonder if we, uh, if we were to pass this, if it would get to a point where we might end up uh, waiving that, if it would become this revolving door of waivers and not if we'd be getting into this waiver conversation. Something that comes to mind, um, in, in my job, we get concerned about days to fill, how, long, how many days it takes to fill a given position. And I wonder, um, uh, maybe Alderman Surik, if you have thoughts on uh, how often do we get to a point where we just we really need to fill this position and we're tired of it being empty and we might be uh, you know tempted to waive it uh, in order to fill the position. Well, yeah, the, the market tends to change, and, and uh, I mean I've been in the business for a long time, and there have been periods of time where you really had very difficult time recruiting people of, of all levels. I think that that's not the case in in, in today's market, so. I don't think you have an issue. I, I, I just, just want to point out something we talked about earlier, and that was uh, department heads and exceptions. Uh, you know, if, if an individual takes a position with the city and, and there is a residency requirement and something occurs where they have a difficulty selling their home, well, look at the private sector. If I were to accept a job with Sergeant General or with Johnsonville Sausage and, and I have a difficult selling my home in, in Indianapolis, Indiana, for example, you know, that, that's my problem. I mean, when I took the position with the company or with the city, and I, I'm 
my, my obligation is to move to that location. If I encounter personal problems, I think that's something you have to consider when you, before you accept the position. So I think there should be exceptions on certain levels, but I think that we've got to make them fairly tight. Okay, thank you. Alderman Gisha. You're swaying me, Jim. <laughs> I was thinking about selling my house quick. <laughs> I, I just thought it was really interesting um, with that electrician situation, the way they gave final preference to. And, uh, and I don't know if that's a softer way of doing resident. What they did was residency, really. Residency preference, not residency plus. I guess in a way we're giving we're taking available talent in the city that may as also may never have been tapped. Uh, like Mr. Bittner, I, I'm, I'm not a strong lover or hater of residency. I know there's no financial benefit to the city for it, so people can forget about that. Because whether somebody's living in that house who works for the city or not, the same taxes are due. It, uh, uh, a moral thing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a moral thing. But, it, you know, so I guess I'm now back. I was off the fence. Now at least I'm on the fence. But I really appreciate what they did with DPW with making that a, one of the criteria. I think that's, that was excellent. Without being asked. Uh, Alder Prisma Montemayor. Uh, thank you, Chairman Balk. If we were to have a residency in requirement for these non-reps, remember that would be valid unless we waived it until next April. And who knows? I, I have a hard time voting for something that can be changed so easily and so quickly every April, and some employees, some human beings, will be caught in this rule trap that we have right now. Interesting. I've seen so many changes over these years that what is legal this year is not legal last year and the next year. Alderman Ryan. Um, <clears throat> I agree and disagree. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I think the, the... He's a politician. Gen the, the general public uh, in the city, the residents of this city, I think they, they most of them uh, believe that a residency requirement is a good thing. Um, I think it would be, it will be a lot easier to pass a residency requirement than to negate a residency requirement in the future. Um, I think once that uh, once that uh, that rule is passed, I don't think it's it's as easy to turn the, to turn the clock back, so to speak. Um, also, I mean, on on this not being a financial benefit to the city, um, I hate to disagree with a professor, but. I don't see how it cannot be a financial benefit to the city because if you have somebody that is coming here and they are either, if they're making as, as a, as a, a well-compensated employee $60,000 a year and they're going to bring in their spouse who's going to be working in the area um, and you have that, that family buying a home in the city. Now, it's not like they're going to displace somebody because there's limited housing. Um, that next person that's coming in, if that home is not available, they're going to have to buy another home or build a home in the city. So I don't see how there cannot be any financial benefit to the city in the long run. I think, I think there's, there's got to be at least a marginal benefit financially for the city. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Ryan. Please, Mr. Montemayor. I, I just have a, a what if question, okay? Because I've seen this happen in the city before, where a gentleman that's it's required to live in the city as a resident rents an apartment here. His family lives in Green Bay, but his residence is in the city. Does that meet the qualifications? I think, Mr. Surick, I think even this would, because you have expertise in this in this issue. Um, well. I think, uh, in my opinion, if they, if they maintain a home outside the city, um, 
and let's say commute on the weekends back to their home outside, their apartment would not, in my opinion, would not be considered their residency. I think but Alderman Warren has, has, has tightened his language that would tighten up or define more clearly what residency is. But again, if it's uh, a Monday through Friday, uh, go to work and leave Friday night to go back my home, to me that would not be truly uh, in the heart of uh, a citizen of the city of Sheboygan. I, I understand, but when, okay, when, you, when you ask somebody to sign a contract, do you require them to have own property in this city? No, we just, the, the offer letter typically has said maintain residence in the city within six months of employment. So technically then he could say, I'm written. Uh, 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 I don't know. I don't, per, I don't. Per, perhaps a, a legal question, or, and maybe we don't have the right expertise in here at right. the time, but uh, does the city have the authority to enforce that and look at someone's federal tax return and find out what their real residency is? Uh, because that's your residency, where you know, uh, where, where you're, where you you know, where you pay the feds from. You can have as many properties as you want, but sure. you tend to pay from where no. you live. Uh, and I don't know if we have that. Is in, well, please, I'll... City, excuse me. City of Wisconsin employment will begin with. So there is no contractor contract between the employee and the city. Say that again, please. State of Wisconsin is employment at will. Ah. So there is no contract specifically between the city and the employee to maintain an employee's employment. So if the city decide that we don't believe that you're truly our resident, my opinion, not being fair, that you probably could terminate their employment. Okay, thank you. And all the person born, would that be your intent? That how how zealous would we be willing to be in order to find out if someone really does have a family in Madison or whatever, Mr. Montemayor is? is well, uh, in the in the city's new residency policy, there's about uh, eleven different tests of what residency is. And I believe in, in my document, it says, uh, let's see. Full-time city residents. Full-time city residents, but I believe uh, the city has the right, if I can, uh, if I can find the white, right whereas in here, that the city can... Uh, mm. yeah. Top of the back page. Whereas failure to reside in the city of Sheboygan full time will result in termination of an employment for newly hired non represented employees, city of Sheboygan. But I had another I had another one in here that said the fact that uh, the city the city can get the, the HR department can get uh, a referral or they can they can do it on their own volition and checking within six months to see whether the person has moved into the city or they can get a referral from that per person's department head that they've heard that they've not li they're not living in the city of Sheboygan but I think ultimately then it would be HR's responsibility to determine whether truly they're living in the city okay and there were some people who had uh, Alderman Gisha I'm on my last hurdle Jim <laughs> I'm right there let's call the roll quick <laughs> <laughs> right there, yeah but uh, I'm, I'm almost uh, Non-reps are only non-reps because they aren't union. I, you know, we have to look forward then to you what... stole my question. What could happen? No. Did I? I'm sorry. No, it's good. What if they unionize? Now we have another... This is one of those things that kind of pushes people to do that kind of thing. Do we, do we have another bargaining unit in the city? Mm -hmm. uh, what do we do? I guess we... Please. I guess we would have to cross that bridge when we come to it. It's... it's and. <laughs> Okay, and uh, Mr. Montemay. If, uh, if I could just mention one more thing. Please. Alderman, Bob. The thing we have to remember, though, is that this is not going to affect anybody who's currently working for the city of Sheboygan. It's only new hires. If they want, if they want to organize on that basis, I guess they have the right to do that. But it's not going to affect anybody who's currently working for the city. Only future hires. And Alderperson Montemayor, did you have a question for Mr. Montemayor? Are they truly a resident? There's a, a number of criteria that the state has, has um, spoken that can be used to see if somebody truly is a resident. So there is a specific criteria in when the code of Sheboygan that will be that we voted on. Okay. And what, if I could just add one thing to Please. This. If I could just add one thing to Alder, what Alderman Montemayor mentioned, 
is that I believe those criteria that you have established have also survived numerous court tests. And that's why Attorney McLean went over this proposed residency policy with a fine-tooth comb, and he's comfortable with, with the tests that you're using based on recent court cases that they, that they would hold up if they're challenged. Okay. Any more questions for, all, uh, for Mr. Montemayor? Well, that was my case because it's what, what do you consider a full-time residency? You know, five days? You know, if the guy... It sounds like those 11 points okay. might be the test right. that we need, uh, though. Okay. That's, that's, I okay. don't have that document Thank in front of me, so... <laughs> Thank you. And um, Mr. Surrey. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're getting a little oh, off sorry. the point here, but we, we talked about you know, this non-bargaining group bargaining, okay? And if they were to decide to go to Union Well, just bring the point out that if, if a group of employees decide to organize and they want to bargain with the city, their benefit package begins with this, nothing. Everything's on the table. So, I mean, they don't start with the benefits you have currently have and work up. You start with a blank sheet. And so that's a point that should be brought out. Okay, and, and what are your thoughts on the effect that this would have? If we pass this, what effect would that have on the represented employees? Uh, because the natural snowballing of this would be, the next step would be going after the unionized employees. And what effect do you think that would have on the next round of bargaining? Well, I, you know, the last bargaining session we had with the fire department, we did put a residency requirement that for the first five years of employment, the employee must maintain residency within the city. With any other bargaining groups, we, do, we have the maintain residency within two-thirds of Sheboygan County. It has been a subject of bargaining. I think that uh, it's probably not as big an issue with the unions as we might think it would be. And uh, because actually with, with the fire department, there, there was no f cost factor involved. We, there was no money put on the table to, to, to bring that benefit about to the city. So I think it's, I think it's an open discussion. I, I don't think it's being a big issue. Okay, thank you. That's very interesting. Um, you know, one thing we need to consider also is this is an employer's market today too. You know, we've talked about how easy it is to sell homes or if, uh, and things of that nature. Right now, we're in the, we're in the driver's seat for people that we hire. Uh, there will come a time when we will uh, we will be starving for employees. You know, the economy will get better and people will be seeking other jobs. So uh, as long as this residency requirement would be in force, there might come a time where uh, you might have we might eventually have to go against mom and apple pie and say that there's a time when we don't require it. But uh, who? Uh, Alder Person Montemayor. Thank you again. Um, I just wanted to make it clear that criteria whereby we those 11 points that could be used are the test to see if department heads are living in the city. That's also the same criteria or the same tests to be sure the other employees that have to live in right. two-thirds of the county are living in their two-thirds of the county. It's the same criteria okay. no matter where. Thank you. And all member Hassel. Thank you, Chairman Bell. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think at the end of the day, I think we have to do what we think is right when we're passing this rather than uh, worrying about whether a unit will organize and become a bargaining unit. I, I also think it's dangerous to, to try to connect this in any thin way even to future union negotiations. I think that fuzzies the discussion. I think it distracts from what we're trying to accomplish here, which is specifically the non-reps. We're a few years off from discussions with the union. Um, Alderman Wongman started the discussion now talking about how this is pretty prevalent in other communities around the state and country. And if that's the case, I'm, I would guess that an arbitrator would look at that favorably from our position if this is a common, because I mean an arbitrator is going to look at comparables out there. So if, if what he's saying is the case, I think we'd be sitting in a good position. Interesting. A great percentage of the municipalities in the state of Wisconsin also have their own uh, city ambulance service, but that argument didn't hold much water about a year ago. Um, but I invite Alderman Ryan to speak up. <laughs> Uh, going, going back to us uh, being in the driver's seat at the moment as far as, uh, as, far as uh, being an employer, you know, you're 100% right. And in the future, I'm sure that we'll, there will hopefully be a time where uh, empl the employment opportunities in our community are much better for everybody. Um, and at that point, even though we may not be such a shining star as an employer, hopefully at that point we'll have more money to spend because if more people are employed, our tax base has gone up. So, I mean, I don't think we can look to the future and think that just because we don't have as many people in the hiring pool to hire because everybody's got great jobs, at that point, the city should be making more money. So, you know, it's 
something that I don't think should be a factor in making this decision today. Because the number of houses that have been built is higher? No, because if, you're, if, you, if you are hiring more people in your community, you have increased your industrial base or done something in order to hire all those people. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you. Alderman Wangaman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are legal definitions of residency. If you look at the motor vehicle code, you'll find it right there. Because uh, if you live seven months in Wisconsin and five months in Alabama and you want to have an Alabama license because it's cheaper, it doesn't work that way. And the state has clearly defined what residency means. And if you want to find out if a person's a resident, take a look at his driver's license and check the license plates on his car. And in, in most cases, uh, the state is very strict about residency rules. And in the 346 section of the Motor Vehicle Code, you'll find uh, very clearly defined what a resident is and what a resident is not. If you live here the, the most of the time and you get your mail here and you earn your money here, the state says, hey, you're a resident of Wisconsin. You pay Wisconsin taxes and you're eligible for a Wisconsin driver's license. But there were people that uh, lived in the uh, sunny south in the summer, in the, in the winter time, and then moved up to Wisconsin and tried to carry a driver's license from one of the southern states, because <clears throat> in many of them, their the license is cheaper, both the plates and the driver's license, but the, the states is not, that doesn't work that Okay, way. good point. Thank you. Any further discussion on this before we uh, take it to a vote? Okay, very, very well. Then what we are uh, voting on is a recommendation to the Common Council on uh, resolution number 50-0809, which is item 549. Uh, uh, please call the roll. Uh, Boren, aye. Chairman Balk, abstain. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm going to do the chairman's option. That's going to be my habit when we do these things to abstain. Uh, for the year. <laughs> Robert's Rules of Orders, it says right in Robert's Rule. <laughs> it says so. Decker? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Montemayor? No. Ryan? Aye. Surik? Aye. Vanderwilly? Aye. Verhasselt? Aye. Ann Wangaman? Aye. Motion carries. Next item. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, it's going to be my habit. I didn't, at the first meeting, I didn't vote either. Um, item number six. <laughs> Suddenly the light's broken on Gish's thing. <laughs> um, a discussion recommendation vote on communication number 90809, which is council item 4-47, a uh, communication from Debbie Desmolin requesting that city allow leashed dogs in Maywood Evergreen Park for a yearly fee. And we will continue with a question and answer period about uh, understanding the, the history of leashed dogs in all the city parks. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we need a motion. Is this actually a... We're going to make a recommendation back to ourselves on communication. Okay. I, would, I would motion then that uh, this uh, goes forward to the council with a favorable recommendation. To allow the dog. However, I do not want Maywood listed in that. Okay, so the communication is specifically about Maywood. The so communication is about Maywood and Evergreen Parks. I do not believe that Maywood belongs in there. Because Maywood is an environmental park that I don't think dogs need to be trampling whatever is Okay, so there. before we get into discussion, so your motion would be to amend it. Do we, do we amend it? I would like to send it forward with a favorable recommendation on Evergreen Park only. Okay, so the motion is to send a recommendation back to the Common Council that says uh, Evergreen Park for yearly fee should be opened up to leash dogs, amended to remove Maywood from the, uh, the citizen's Correct. letter. Is there a second? Second. Under discussion. And did you want to sure. pick up from there? Please. All um, in the, you know, the reason I, I didn't want Maywood on there, and I wouldn't have wanted Maywood on there to start with, uh, Maywood is an environmental park. I mean, it's a, it's a park that is set up with a certain uh, foliage growing, growing in certain areas. 
Um, it's not a place that you want a dog off of the trail trampling over everything. Um, therefore, I don't believe Maywood belongs on there. As far as Evergreen Park goes, or any other park for that matter at this point, um, we beat the heck out of this subject. Was it last year or the year before? I uh, went round and round and round, and what we ended up with out of it was a dog run, which is a place you could take your dog off leash down by um, Lakeview Park, which you have to go down a steep hill. Um, if you're not an agile person, you're not getting down there to start with. Basically, you're, you're, you're going down a, a, a gravelly hill in order to get your dog down to the beach. Um, I believe uh, besides that we had two other parks? Six others? We have six now that, that a dog can be walked on a leash. Um, there are six out there? What are those, if I may? Okay, and uh, we're going to go, well, I'm going to, I've written that down, we'll get back to that. Uh, Alderperson Montemayor, next uh, is Alderman Wangaman. Are we speaking to the amendment now, or? My original intention was to speak to the entire document, not just the amendment. The motion is that we send a recommendation to ourselves as an amended document saying no Maywood, but yes Evergreen. Do we need to vote on the amendment? It's the discussion on the amendment. It's just a discussion. So, so do we want to continue the dis do we want to discuss the amendment? No. Or take a vote on the amendment? Okay, we'll take a mo uh, mo <laughs> vote on the amendment to discuss this document just considering Evergreen Park and leaving Maywood off the table. Um, Alderman Verhassel. Thank you, Chairman Bauck. If I just, I, before we vote, I, would, I guess I just wanted to point out with this council's action here in the <clears> last year or so, we've effectively made Evergreen and Maywood one contiguous park. Um, so, and in, granted, Evergreen is a little more, uh, I guess, uh, what you might consider your traditional park, but it's not too far distant from the ecological standing of Maywood as well. So I would have some concern about making that a Blending dog the two. friendly park as well. Okay, thank you. Any more discussion on, uh, did you want to, okay, Alderperson Montemayor. Um, thank you. It really is Evergreen Maywood right now because the sand cranes that have come to Maywood go into Evergreen. The new, um, whatever the new critter is that is now visiting Maywood also goes into uh, Evergreen. And, and the otter, the otter, that also goes into Maywood. Though the the animals don't know where the edge of Maywood is, they don't, and they, yeah, right. They don't. They're not good at reading those signs. Okay. It thank is you. one park now. It is one park. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then we will vote on the amendment. The amendment being to uh, to consider them as separate parks and to treat our discussion for tonight to be to approve Evergreen uh, and not uh, and keep Maywood off the table. Uh, so please call the roll. Decker. Kisha. No. Heidemann. Aye. Kittleson. No. Montemayor. No. Ryan. Aye. Surik. No. Vanderweele. No. Verhasselt. No. Wangaman. No. Boren. No. Uh, mo uh, the uh, amended motion fails. Okay, amendment fails. Then, if we were to dis if we in order to discuss further, I need a motion to accept the communication uh, or whatever your pleasure is, the communication as written. Um, All the person Kittleson. No, I'm I'm taking chairman's privilege. I will not vote throughout the year unless my vote is needed to to, to break. Um, please, Alderman Kill uh, Alderperson Kittleson. Thank you, Chairman Balk. I would make a <clears throat> recommendation that we file this document. Second. Okay, we have a motion and second to file the document uh, under discussion. Alderperson Heideman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, though this, whether you want to have a dog walking in a park, I guess I would have been against any fee established. They're already paying taxes. Uh, they're already walking in six of the parks, so that in one or two parks you're going to charge them to, to walk in there. It really didn't make any sense. 
Thank you, uh, Alderman Heidemann. If I could ask Alderperson Montemayor, could you yes. say um, which six parks? Okay. The Overland Park on leash, Lake View Park on leash, and then the sub uh, is the beach off leash. That's just, so that's two parks. Green Wing on leash, Terry Andre on leash, Pigeon River Corridor on leash or off. And then, of course, number six, it will be the new fenced in town of Wilson um, off leash. That's that. So we have six specialty dog areas right now. And how many of those are in the city of Sheboygan? Uh, the only one, well, Wilson is going to be operated, both of us, and then, of course, um, Terry Andre is right. on the south part. Okay, thank you. So these are all Sheboygan dogs using these six parks. Okay, right? thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Alderman Wangaman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You. you know, all of this on face seems very good. Um, collecting the fees and uh, granting people the right to walk their dogs on a, on a leash in city parks. And I'm a dog lover. I have three dogs. I've got a Sherman Shepherd the size of a small horse. And I've, I've got a uh, yellow lab and a, uh, uh, a Sheltie. But I would be against this because, first of all, I have to look at it from an enforcement standpoint. Maybe it's my past employment history that makes me do that. Please but, talk about that. That was one But of how do you questions. enforce something like this? It's almost impossible. I mean, we got, what, 30-some parks in the city? What are we going to do? Hire 30 new policemen just to run around in parks mm -hmm. and see people paid their fine or not? Or, I mean, their, their uh, fee? Uh, would you carry a little license in your pocket? Or would you have to have a receipt with you that says, yes, I paid my fee? Uh, and you know as well as I do, the minute you grant something like this, there are going to be people who are going to violate it. They're going to let their dogs off the leash. We used to stop them all the time on the lakefront. And they'd say, well, you know, my dog is under voice control at all times. Well, voice control isn't a leash, you know. And it, it's just like, oh, man, that's just what we need is another ordinance we can't enforce. An ordinance isn't worth the paper it's written on unless you can enforce it in some way. And this is almost unenforceable because there just isn't the manpower to do it. You know, it, it, it's just not practical to go around. So on that alone I, I, I would be against it, but uh, I don't take this to mean that I'm against dogs because I, you know, I, I love my dogs and at least two of them are smarter than I am. You know? So, and I want to continue down that thinking just for a moment. What if it were to be any dog in any park as long as it was on a leash? Would that be enforceable? No. There just isn't the manpower to do this. I mean, I forget how many parks the city has. Does anybody know? For, it's like 33 or something like that. Can you imagine what a mess this is for the police department to try and enforce, you know, people? And how would you tell if somebody paid their fee or not? Like I said, what would they have right. to have? Right. No, no, no. I understand that. I just meant... Yeah. Okay. It's, 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 it's nearly not enforceable. In fact, it's difficult to enforce even now. And it's not a police officer's favorite thing to do, to be going around and be a doggy policeman, you know. It's just... Uh, <laughs> It's just not their favorite. It's not real high on their list of uh, things they have to accomplish for the day. But it's a, it's a, it would be almost unenforceable. But apparently picking up old ladies whose paperwork is 10 days out of date is a big priority. <laughs> That's another whole story. Um, who's next? Uh, Alderman Surik, please. Yeah, I just concur with Alderman Wingham. I, I spent some time you know, fishing the Pigeon River, both Evergreen Park and Maywood. And you can't really, you can't, I can read signs, but you can't tell which park is which. So, but that issue is dead. But the other part is, is enforcement. I, I can't imagine, because of the geography of the land, having to, you would know, have to post enforcement officers, you know, every 100 yards to make certain that no one is violating the law. So uh, to me, it would be an impractical, impractical law. Thank you. So just, maybe it's a rhetorical question, maybe it's not, but we should, we should deny taxpayers the right to enjoy the outdoors at their leisure for the parks that they pay simply because the bad apples can't be enforced against? And apparently from all the person Montemayor's reaction, that is not a rhetorical question. <laughs> That's right. The taxpayers, the taxpayers get to use all the parks. We get to use all of the parks. We could even go into the specialty parks if we want to, the specialty dog parks. But we get to use all of the parks, we taxpayers, with ourselves, our, our children and our grandchildren who are also city residents. We get to use all the parks, we taxpayers. And, right, but I think that that ignores a great deal of population who is very close with their dogs. And, and their, their children, dogs are well behaved. And their children, and they get to use all of the parks as well. Who, who does? 
the, the dog owners. They also oh. get to use the parks, and their children also get to use the parks. Right, but they're dogs. Plus, they also have some specialty parks to use that we're paying for. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, next is Alderman Gisha. Uh, I don't really want to speak to the it's, issue except to say that I wouldn't want to meet Alderman Surik's dog on or off a leash in any park. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, your mic's still on. Sorry. Alder Person Kittleson. I is, my, is my light on? I mean, yeah. I thought my no it's not is it, am I okay yes okay thank you I just wanted to say that you know the dog study committee did such a wonderful study and gave us a final report and I think we really have studied this subject to, to you know at length at length and and this report is excellent and it lists all the parks and um, I, I, I just feel too. What is you know we can we have the right to put our dog on a leash and walk on any city sidewalk that you know too that we want. So we can walk our dogs all over the place. Um, so the so if I could just ask, um, oh, if I could just ask a question because I wasn't an older person when that sure. when that dialogue was happening. And yes. thank you to Mr. Montemayor. He sent me a from uh -huh. 2005 until 2007 a, a, a good list of all those proceedings. So can you help me understand? the dialogue that happened with regard to why we would deny citizens with dogs that right what, what, what is what is the what is the overwhelming need to deny them were, were dogs misbehaving were dogs what do you mean deny them deny taxpayers who have dogs from enjoying our parks uh, that's what I'm trying to understand what was that dialogue what, what was the overwhelming need oh, to do that to do that um, well they were <laughs> We had, there were several public meetings. I mean, how many meetings? There were, I can't, it, it's the whole list here. They held at the Roker Room, 50 citizens in attendance, 20 speakers. And I think there was just a real, uh, a lot of passion with the, with the topic and for and against, if you recall, Alderman Montemayor. Um, so what were the dogs doing, though, that compelled us well, I don't to think, restrict I th taxpayers' rights to take their dogs into city-owned parks? That's what I'm trying to understand. I think one of the major things was that dog owners were not cleaning up after their pets. Okay, so that, okay, that I get that. that. That's something out. I can understand. I get were, that. Right. So that, dog there are bad apples that are ruining it for others. That were ruining, right, okay. ruining it for others. Okay, I get that. Mm -hmm. Poop in the parks. Right. What else? Um, oh, gosh. Uh, help me out there, Mer Alderman. Of course, of course. And, and I object to having them be considered more of a taxpayer than I am. Uh, Their owners are taxpayers. Yes, own. that's correct. Uh, it wasn't, it, uh, the letters and the people weren't just concerned about the poop and the pee, which they were because that would be all over, even if they picked it up afterwards. It was the numbers of people who talked about very nice dogs, wonderful, fluffy, your pet, yes, terrifies the children. And it's not the dog being awful, it's a dog being a dog. And I, I just don't know the overwhelming need, the compulsing need that are there attacks there uh, don't even have to be attacks for instance let me tell you about our four-year-old daughter many years ago she's 45 now playing and a very nice dog chased her to play with her stood on her chest and barked in her face he didn't attack her but he terrified her of course and I, and I know that that's why it's such, so yes. uh, visceral for you, and I, yes. and I understand that. And that's unfortunate, horrible for your daughter. But I don't know that that is compelling enough to deny other taxpayers the rights to use the park. I think if you'll see dogs in parks, and people bring dogs to parks now when they're not supposed to, and if they're sitting very nicely with their owner, and they are sitting very nicely, and they're not attacking, they're not barking, but there'll be a large perimeter around that person and their dog where other people don't come and sit. But I, but I think that's self-selection based on the citizen. That's a citizen's correct. choice. That's correct. Um, and I, again, I, so I guess we just kind of disagree on whose compelling need should prevail there. But that's okay. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Alderman Decker's next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to say that uh, on the safety issue, um, I'm actually thinking of it in another way, another perspective. A lot of people in the city don't believe our city as, is as safe as it was. And I, I know a lot of people who say that. Well, in those respects, 
bringing a dog to the park, you know, that throws off people, you know, and it, it's true. And um, just like having a dog at your house, you know, mm -hmm. somebody's banging on the back door, the dog starts barking. You know, same, same thing. And when it comes to a couple of people um, ruining it for others and not cleaning up dog feces, whatever, I don't believe that should completely deny the whole subject because, uh, I mean, this might be way out of out in left field, but you got people who speed on the streets. We're not going to tell people you got to start stop driving because we got a couple of people speeding on the streets. You know. Okay. So dogs can make certain citizens feel safer and, and enable them to enjoy the city more or differently. I believe so. And I wonder also about the poop. If that, uh, can I say that? Um, if that is as prevalent of a problem as it certainly could be, but well, I don't know if it's such just, a problem that it would deny people the use of that. Because we, we only have four locations in the city. We might have six in the area, but we have four parks in the city. And if you have numerous and numerous and numerous people going to just these four parks, and there's just some couple of bad apples, like you said, in these four parks, well, yeah, it's going to make it look bad for everybody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, you only have four parks. So if there's a couple going to these parks, well, there you have it. Okay, thank you. And just in the interest of full disclosure, I don't even have a dog. Um, I am just looking out for the rights taxpayers. Uh, Alderman Verhasso, please. Thank you, Chairman Bob. I mean, uh, you know, I've heard the uh, argument about you know, these analogies about speeders and so on. And in fact, we actually do take speeders off the road if they speed too often, even though they're the minority. We do suspend their license and take them off the road, and we say you can't drive on those roads, even though you've paid for them through your federal tax dollars, through your state tax dollars. So there are examples similar to that. Um, but, you know, to your point earlier here 10 minutes ago is that we have all kinds of taxpayers here, not just dog-owning taxpayers. I personally would not, I would not bring my, one, my two- and four-year-old to parks if I knew there would be a handful of dogs there all the time. I just wouldn't. My four-year-old was bit by a dog two years ago, and he's deathly afraid of it. And people may argue the merits of whether he should just get used to it and come to accept dogs, but the fact is he's not a dog fan, and, and no one in my family really is. I have nothing against dogs, but I don't own dogs, and I don't wish to be around dogs in park situations for a number of reasons, the unpredictability. And you have the waste matter. Again, most dog owners, I'm sure, pick up after their dogs, and most dogs, actually all dogs, I think, if you ask their dog owner, are the sweetest, nicest little dog out there in the world and they have anything to harm anybody. But the fact is, a small percentage of them do ruin it for the whole. And I think we as legislators need to take that into account. Statistics show, I think it's somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of us are dog owners. So therefore, there's an equal and op opposite percentage then, 40, 50 percent of us that are not. And I think we have to be considerate of those as well. We do have six parks in place, as Alderman Montemayor already pointed out. So. If we were sitting at zero, I would see the argument to be a little bit stronger, but we have six opportunities around the city. So you would suggest that perhaps if there are 33 parks in town, that 60% of those 33 parks should have Certainly access would not. because 60% of Sheboyganites own a dog. I would not extrapolate it that way. Okay, no, just checking. Um, Alderman Ryan. Thank you. Um, you know, basically, we don't have six parks. We have four parks. If we look at the list, we have North Point and North and North Park listed as two locations. Um, we have the Green Wing Ponds listed as a park. The Green Wing Ponds is an, isn't a park. The Green Wing Ponds, Ponds is, a, is a stormwater facility. It's not a park. Um, if we look at this, and basically, I mean, I, I was involved from the start last time around. This, this whole, whole communication tonight basically was not written well. Um, it had Maywood and Evergreen specifically listed, which, number one, it shouldn't have. I mean, I think this should be a discussion for um, not necessarily Maywood or Evergreen, but looking at the whole situation again, looking at the map of the four areas we actually have in the city, and can we open up more areas to dogs? Um, you know, but, but, but what's happened, and it's hap it happened in the committee on, on, on the recommendations last time, is you have some people that are, are seriously anti-canine on those committees that even to get those four areas passed 
was a stretch. Um, and the people that came out of uh, out to the public hearings, um, it seemed to be a lot of people that were not exactly dog lovers, put it that way. So, I mean, this communication tonight is not proper. It shouldn't have been written the way it was, and I don't know how it, it came in this way or who put it in in that fashion. The citizen did. Right. But I think, I think this should be discussed more, however, not under this communication. Um, you know, as, as, we, as we say, if 60% of us are dog owners, do we necessarily need to have 60% of our parks open to dogs? No. <clears throat> but can we have more than four? I believe we can. Okay, thank you. I just have a question um, that gets... Sheboygan can sometimes be resistant to change. We like things the way they are. I've spent a significant amount of time in all of the boroughs of New York City and Manhattan uh, and lived in Paris for a while. Big cities. New York City, one of the most densely populated places on the face of the earth. Parks with dogs in them everywhere. A park with 150 dogs in them, all running around, kissing each other, sniffing each other, doing what dogs do. People sitting there enjoying a sandwich. Kids running around enjoying their parents enjoying a sandwich. I don't understand. What I'm, what I'm having a hard time understanding is uh, how, if they can make it work in New York City, where it's the most densely populated place on the face of the earth, why we can't seem to get along with dogs and kids and park goers in our massive parks in the city of Sheboygan. That's the question I'm, I'm not getting answered. What I've heard is, is there are some safety concerns. Kids get scared, which is a legitimate concern. People don't clean up, and that's a legitimate concern. But still not understanding how, why in Sheboygan, with our massive size parks and multitude of parks, why we can't make this work. And I wish I would have been paying attention two, three years ago when you guys were having that dialogue. Um, next up is Alderman Wongaman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, this whole discussion is not about dogs. It's about people. You know, if dogs ran the world, we'd all be better off. <laughs> uh, we really would. You know, but it's about people. It's about irresponsible owners. It, it was brought up that why should a, a few people or why should the many suffer for the misdeeds of the few? Well, that's the way all laws are written. I mean, not everybody in this room goes out and speeds. Nobody here, I don't think, commits murder or robs banks or holds up mini marts. Or, but laws are made because of a few bad eggs, always. And that, that's always going to happen. And it, it's just the way, I mean, if there weren't any bad eggs, you wouldn't need a, a law for laws. anything. You know, we, wouldn't need, we wouldn't need any laws. So. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I wanted to ask uh, Alderperson Kittleson and Alderman Verhasselt whether this was just going to the Committee of the Whole, or did you refer this back to the to the uh, what committee is it? The Parks, Parks Board and Recreation. Parks and Recreation. Is yes. it going there also? It already did, we already we already. Thank you, Chairman. We already talked about this in Public Works, and we talked about it, and we it was referred to the Board of Parks, and it was talked about there as well. Did they make a recommendation? I think the, the communication was filed in both uh, in both the uh, okay. both committees. Okay. Clearly, because filed. of the narrowness of it, it's it right. has less because of the narrow well. right. If, if okay. I could mm -hmm. ask one other question, uh, Alder Person Kittleson, you yes. made the motion to file. Yes. Who is the second? Was that Alder? Thank you, Alderman Montemayor. Thank you. A couple more comments, then we need to break. Uh, call out a night for the finance committee meeting. Alderman Gisha, please. Thank you, Chairman. I don't own a dog. My wife does. I don't. So therefore, <laughs> I pay no. Are you John Kerry? I pay no attention to the animal. Uh, so therefore, I don't take it to the parks. You could take a dog to the park with. Do we have an issue for those who do do that type of thing? Do we have an issue with too many dogs at the current parks we have available to to have dogs in? I mean, are we bulging at the seams at the? Use Alderman uh, Ryan's number. The four parks in the city are they are dogs falling off the curbing because they're just too packed in the park. I, uh, I, I wonder if that point is moot though, because people it's a long way to travel. As I understand it, what I'm hearing is a long way to travel to get to those parks, and I pay taxes. Why can't I use a park? Walk to the house? lakefront, which is the city is only so many blocks this way. Uh, they sound like they're pretty well spaced apart. I mean, are we overcrowded in our current parks and need more space for okay. uh, these animals? Thank you. Um, uh, last two comments, uh, Alder Person Montemayor. I'll make it quick. Um, Harold Beeble, who was chairman of the Dog Park um, Study Group, is a dog owner and a dog lover. So I do not believe at all that the study group disliked dogs. Right. 
Okay, thank you. And I just want to make one more comment. Uh, the SPD, I asked someone from the SPD to be here so they could talk about enforceability, and I appreciate. Uh, is there anything you wanted to add to Alderman Wangaman? He talked about enforceability earlier. Okay, I apologize. I, I should have invited you up earlier, but he, uh, <laughs> but he spoke quite admirably in the defense of uh, street, street folk, the street cops. Um, okay, so last comment uh, by Alderman Verhassel. Uh, thank you, Chairman Baum. I was part of the park and forestry, actually. I chaired it back when this had its genesis. So I was knee deep in the discussion at that time, and I embarked upon a little bit of a study around the state again just to see. And to your comments about whether Sheboygan's in the times or behind the times, and so on, I can tell you at the time of the study, it was about two years ago, probably about two years ago this summer, I believe. At that time, Green Bay had no dog parks, Brown County had one. Appleton, and I'm using cities similar mm -hmm. to us, Appleton had zero, out of game he had one. And it was illegal to have your dog on a leash in those parks? In those other parks in the sure. city. Uh, the same was true, Oshkosh, Fond du Lac, Madison had three to four, I think it was three or four parks, uh, but it was not very common whatsoever. Interesting, It was, seemed to be handled at the county level for whatever reason. What, what do you mean by that? It was county ran. Oh, they were, they were, they were county, county parks? Ran, out of Gimme County ran, ah, the cities did not run these parks. Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, I will just f float the idea that uh, if you're out there in TV land or if you're here tonight, I'm considering uh, floating an ordinance that would allow dogs on leashes in parks. So if you have strong feelings either way, send them to me. You can get my uh, web address on the uh, city's website. I'm considering it. So send me, send me your feedback and then I'll know what to do. Um, Mr. Montemayor, got to be quick. If you promise, you'll be quick. You're not going to sway me from entertaining the idea of an ordinance, though. <laughs> Nothing you say makes any difference. <laughs> I can disagree with some of your statements. You said that we don't furnish. We have over 400 miles of sidewalk. And between the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah, but that's not a park. That you can walk your dog. All we ask you is to have a leash and pick up, pick up the feces. I get it. Yeah. I get that. Okay. And a safety problem. It's a health and safety problem. Kids roll around in the grass and stuff in the parks. I want to give you a good example of this. At Kiwanis Park, one of our heavily used parks, last summer, it got to the point that it was a health issue. Then we had to get permission from the DNR to take the droppings from the geese. But we had to do it, get permission from them. And guess how we got rid of those geese? With a dog. With a dog. Now I'm confused. What does that mean? <laughs> dog, dog will chase things. Scare geese who poop all over our parks away? And, and we've, we've, we've talked about that. Okay. Oh. Is that there's no children around because they have a rule that says well, children under 14 are okay. not allowed. Thank and you. the only thing you see there is dogs and the people that own yeah. the dogs. Thank you. And I know your family has real strong feelings about this, so I appreciate Thank that. You. So just to the citizens, send me emails. That's how you, you best, or phone, whatever you want to, you know, send me information to let me know whether or not we should entertain that idea. So that's, uh, so we need to vote on 0908. Um, that's the end of discussion. Uh, a vote to approve would be uh, to approve to file this communication. Uh, so please call the roll. Gisha. Aye. Heidemann. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Uh, Montemayor. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Surik. Aye. Vanderweele. Aye. Verhasselt. Aye. Wangaman. Aye. Boren, aye. And Decker. Aye. Motion carries the file. Okay, and then our next meeting, um, I've been asked to hold a meeting on July 28th. I'm just checking my calendar to make sure. Um, July 28th at the fire department. It will be at the Sheboygan C C Main City Fire Department uh, to discuss the quality assurance program uh, of the city's ambulance service. So that is my intent, unless uh, any of the members of the body have thoughts on they'd, they'd like an, an additional meeting in July or uh, an earlier meeting in July. Which fire department? Um, it'll be in the, uh, the, main, the main fire department. North, North 25th. Um, and, so, and that'll come out. We'll get communication out on that soon. Is that going to be televised? Yes, it will. Uh, it won't be live, but it'll be taped. Okay, so uh, entertain a moment to adjourn. What time so would that be? Um, Second. I'll, I'll get it to you. Okay. All right, okay, we stand adjourned. Thank you for a great night. <laughs>